Hi ladies and gents, so I wanted to give some whole class feedback on your answers to um, the second part of Death of a Salesman, um, Unit 4 to 10. So I've, I've written some individual comments on the Moodle forum and hopefully you've read that. But I thought there were some interesting patterns emerging really on, on what people uh, were saying and sometimes people agreed and sometimes, sometimes people disagreed. So I wanted to pick out some of the most important strands for me and uh, talk about it all together. So I want to talk about Ben um, and the way I see Ben and, and comment on, on the way people read him. Um, I wanted to comment on the lies in the restaurant just briefly. Uh, the planting of the carrots um, just before um, Willie's death um, and the motivations for that. And Howard as well and um, how we evaluate Howard's treatment of Willie. So those are kind of the four topics I'd like to discuss. So if we start with Ben. Um, ben was the, the person where I, I actually learned something because um, um, in the answers it was pointed out to me, something I hadn't noticed before. Uh, when he's talking to Charlie about Ben and Charlie says, are you going to inherit money from Ben who's died? And, and, and Willie says to Ben, no. Um, he's got seven sons uh, and I'd, I'd always read Ben as being childless I thought he hadn't married and the reason I'd thought that is because of the dramatic presentation of him in the play he comes across as extremely um, individualistic um, he seems to be very detached from his family he doesn't seem to be aware that his mother had died, for instance. This comes as news to him when he comes back home. And he doesn't seem terribly upset about it. I think it's very significant that he calls Willie William. He uses this formal phrase, um, which doesn't, which nobody else does, uh, which is very distancing. Um, so I'd always read Ben as something of a loner, but it turns out he did have this separate family. So that taught me uh, the importance of, of um, paying attention to detail. But nonetheless, I think it, it was significant that um, you feel that he is um, somebody cut off, really, who only cares about himself. For me, the key moment, with, well, one of the key moments, probably the uh, key physical moment of dramatic presentation is where he's fighting Biff in this play fight and then he pulls this dirty trick on him. And he says, never fight fair with a stranger boy. And this, this real dark kind of malevolence comes out of Ben at this point. I think it came out very strongly in the um, Dustin Hoffman version that we watched. Um, but the one thing I wanted to stress with Ben is I think some people, they, they kicked off their answers with a bit of an easy shortcut. And they said, Ben represents the American dream. Ben represents everything that Willie wants, everything that Willie aspires to. And... It's not exactly wrong, but it's. I think that's too simplistic um, because um, there are different models of success and different kinds of men that can be admired that are presented in this play. And I think it's very interesting that on page 71, Willie starts to argue back against Ben um, and stand up for his own way of doing things against Ben's. Now, they're both about success, they're both about financial success, but there's a different way of achieving that, which I think is highly significant, and you need to be aware of it. Let me read out what Willie says to Ben. He starts off by praising his boy. Without a penny to his name, three great universities are begging for him, and from there the sky's the limit, because it's not what you do, Ben. It's who you know. And the smile on your face, it's contacts, Ben, contacts. The whole wealth of Alaska passes over the lunch table at the Commodore Hotel. And that's the wonder, the wonder of this country, that a man can end with diamonds here on the basis of being liked. And all the time on the stage, Ben's trying to edge himself out of the room. He's saying, I've got to go. Uh, goodbye, William. He doesn't want to listen to this. He thinks it's garbage. But... For for Willie, this is the fundamental basis of his life. And this is how he's tried to achieve his dreams. Ben's gone out and he's been an active, heroic figure. He's gone into the jungle and he's been a pioneer. And he reminds me of one of those wild 19th century Wild West pioneers going out into the wilderness and carving out something 
in a physically courageous way. That's not Willie's way at all. Willie is a more 20th century way of achieving success and it's about relationships. In, a modern, in modern business vocabulary, we'd call it networking. It's about connections and it's about people liking you. Um, there is this other part of Willie that is all about um, the yearning for freedom and yearning for the, a connection with the physical world. This is um, Willie who is the person who um, has built the house, who um, admires a man who can use tools, okay? And he's, he associates that with Ben because Ben's been this sort of macho man who, who's um, been very physically brave. But ultimately, that's not the path that Willie's taken. And Willie's taken the path of the salesman. And, the, and that's all about uh, trying to make yourself popular um, and trying to live in this sort of modern 20th century world. Um, whereas Ben, I think, represents a, a world which is somehow more, more of a world of the past, of, of, um, of, sort of the, these epo, epic loner heroes when there was still uncharted and unmapped parts of the world. Um, so Willie represents modernism um, to some extent. Um, and so you can see that they're both about money. They're both about making money. They're both about being successful. But um, there's a debate in the play about um, what's the admirable way to do it? What's the, tr what's the, what's the true path forwards? Um, so that, that's worth reflecting on, really. The danger always with um, Death of a Salesman is just think, oh, it's about the American dream. But there's more than one dream in this play. There's several dreams. And if you can start to look at how these dreams compete and jostle and there's a debate between those dreams, at that point you come up with an interesting, an interesting interpretation. Just writing down he represents the American dream is too straightforward. It's too easy. We need to question what that dream is in some detail. So that's Ben. Um, Howard. Howard, I thought we could relate to tragedy in a really interesting way as I read your answers. Um, I asked you, do we do we think that Howard should have kept Willie on? Should we, should he allow Willie to have kept his job? Do we hate? Should we hate Howard for doing what he does? There's no right and wrong answer to that. This is a question, a difficult question, that Willie um, the, uh, asks of us, and Arthur Miller asks this of us. You know, if you're if you're a, a boss of a company like Howard is. And you've got a guy on your books and he's falling to pieces. What do you do? What's your responsibility as a manager? Now, as a human being, you should have compassion. So, of course, you should treat him with kindness. Yeah, that's kind of obvious. And people said that and that's fine. But the harder thing then would be, well, should he allow him to stay in his job when he can't do his job? Um, that's kind of what Charlie offers. You know, he says, come and work with me. I know you're, you're no good, but you can come and work with me anyway. Now, Howard doesn't make that offer. He, he throws him out on his ear. Um, and it occurred to me that, you know, if, if we, depending on what we think about Howard's action, that changes the element of tragedy that we perceive here. Because if we think that Howard should have kept him on, that makes Howard a villain. OK, so that makes him a tragic villain. That makes him like an Iago figure. He's done something wicked, he's done something cruel, he's done something immoral. Biff thinks that, he calls him a bastard who, who, owed him some, who owed him something. He thinks that he's done something immoral. But from a hard-headed capitalist point of view, Howard's probably done his job, you know? So if we step away from the individual and we think about the system, I, I think that you can see tragic fate operating here that Willie's life has been leading up to this point inexorably, inevitably, because ultimately Willie was, wasn't a great salesman and eventually his body and his mind let him down and he's got nothing to fall back on. He's got no savings, he's got no, he's got no pension to speak, you know, he's got nothing. Um, so I think, you know, we can see tragic fate operating and... And the version of tragic fate that Miller offers us here, it's not the gods, which it is what it would have been for the ancient Greeks. It is this sort of modern 20th century capitalism in its American form, where there is no welfare state, where ultimately 
if you can't support yourself, you're in deep, deep trouble. Um, and that's the kind of tragic, um, tragic um, conclusion that that Will is brought to. And I don't re personally, I don't really read Howard as a villain, because I think you know Howard was playing his inevitable part in the system, just like Willie was. So he points to a, a, a wider problem, I think, Miller. He points to a problem with the system rather than with individuals. Okay. Um, I wanted to make a, sh a short point about the lies in the restaurant. Um, some people, I think, just listed a list of the lies and didn't comment on them. But it's important that we do comment on the significance of these details. I'm not going to ask you to just give some quotations for the sake of it. We always need to interpret and think, OK, well, why does this matter? What, what does this show us? Um, and basically, you've got Biff, but mostly happy, really, telling a whole bunch of lies, which is all geared towards creating an image of themselves that is going to give them immediate sensual gratification. Basically, they want to get laid. OK, they want these women to sleep with them. They want to have a good time, have a drink with them, whatever. Um, and so they create this this illusion. I think this fits into a wider pattern of truth and deception, of lies and reality, um, of people running away from the truth uh, to create these comforting fake lies, which give them kind of, um, you know, a nice time temporarily. Um, and some people include as the final lie, um, Happy's lie, which is as they're leaving the restaurant with the girls and, and Happy says... I don't know who this guy is, to Willie, you know, he's just this old guy, I don't know him. Um, I think the more, the more perceptive answers included that as, as, as one of the lies, because it really matters that. And, and for me, it's one of the most heartbreaking moments in the play where um, you get a son turning his back on his father, this person that he should love, for the sake of some, you know, for lust, basically. Um, and of course, there's this sort of painful irony because it parallels um, Willie with his mistress in the hotel room, where Willie turned his back on his wife for some cheap thrills with, with a woman in a hotel room. Um, so, you know, um, Willie's no saint, he's no, he's no um, angel. But um, the son is kind of repeating the sins of the father, really. Um, so these sorts of connections and parallels um, are, are worth exploring, I think, because um, it, it all adds to the dramatic power of the play. The planting of the carrots was my third topic that caught my eye and made me think, because I think a lot of people were giving kind of symbolic interpretations of the carrot planting, some of it was coming from the Kahoot you'd done earlier or kind of readings elsewhere on the internet. You know, what does the carrot planting mean? It's a legacy. What does it symbolise? It's trying to create this kind of future for his for his family, etc. Which is useful insight. But the question asked, why does Willie do it? And a minority of students actually took that seriously. And I admired those students who did. Thinking about, well, why does Willie do it? Because I know why Miller puts it into the script. I know why he's created this as a metaphor and as a symbol. And you can write about that in your sort of exam answers and you'll get marks for it. But I th it's interesting to think about from Willie's perspective and Willie's point of view, what makes him do it at that point? And it turns out to be quite a difficult question <laughs> because it's crazy. Now, one or two people made that point. The point they said the point is this is, this is nuts. This is irrational. This is part of Miller um, showing Willie's breakdown into irrationality. So the point about this is that there is no reason for it. It's, it is irrational and it strikes us as absurd. And that was an important part of it. Um, it might be that there's some kind of unconscious wish to create some kind of benefit for his family. But I don't think that's really what consciously makes Willie do this. Um, I don't think that's what's going through his mind. I think one thing that is going through his mind is a, is a, a need for comfort, actually. That he wants to get his hands into the earth 
and to do something that he feels is productive not for his kids not for his family but just to create something that's going to have some kind of genuine positive benefit and it's a tiny little thing but we have to think in terms of dramatic context this comes after he's lost everything he's lost his job um he knows that he's kind of nearing the end of his life he's coming to the decision that he's going to kill himself so i think he's trying to create this contact with nature which he finds consoling i think he finds it a comfort um and it is kind of crazy and it is kind of mad but emotionally it makes sense for willie so i think it's 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 always easy to forget about that emotional level in plays but for for miller it's it's massive you know the the, the emotional truth that these characters are expressing and the emotional journey that they're on everything that these characters do is come out of feeling and emotion it's not just kind of this game of symbols and metaphors so we need to recognize the symbols and metaphors but also feel what these characters are feeling and what it, once we kind of get those two together connected together that's when we've got really powerful analysis i think okay um and that was my final topic really so th these were the thoughts that your answers made me think about and where you were kind of giving a range of different things. And so I just wanted to share where my, my thinking ended up having read yours. Um, in the comments, if you would, I'd like you to pick out from what I've said one idea that you think was either new for you or that you found helpful or that made you think in any way. Something that you found of value, and I'd like you to record that in the comments. So just pick out one thing. I'd be interested to see what you pick out, and it will help you to take something useful out of this YouTube. Just reflect, choose, tell me something that you liked about, about this analysis. You could even tell me something that you disagreed with, okay, and argue back against it. Because ultimately, if you've got that debate and that argument, that's the most useful thing of all, okay? But just find something useful that you found in the talk, pop it in the comments, and I'd love to read your comments. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.